married him because he's fine. One girl told me, well, when I saw those pretty dreads on his head, I just fell in love because I think dreads are so sexy. So now, fast forward with seven, eight years into the marriage, guess what happened? Good luck. He had the little clown ball hey, spot at the top, oh, and the dress was just on top. Here's the deal. They got the man units now. Um, but she was no longer attracted to him because he was bald. Stupid stuff. She said it last night. You better not be married over and over no uh, 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 physical attraction or flesh. Because that's going to change. Either her or, or my sister said it. That's going to change. Everything that's standing up on you right now is going to eventually fall down one day. And if you haven't married in inside God's will, it's going to fall. You know, I hear people, I'm just not attracted to her anymore. So your marriage to that person was the for a superficial purpose. Wow. Because if, if attraction can cause you to become a covenant breaker, hmm. marriage is covenant. If physical attraction can cause you to break a God-ordained covenant, you were never firmly planted in his will in the first place. Wow. When you want to get married, I don't know who this is for, and I'll come back to these questions. When you want to get married, a lot of people think to have legal sex and to get tax breaks and possibly have kids for those that have a baby. But what you don't prepare for are the fights, the disagreements, the 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 um, divisions, the the rips and the tears that happen in your soul because of one displaced conversation, the trauma you sustain from unintentional hurtful things that are said. I didn't mean to hurt you with this, but it was the truth. No, you're not the best lover I ever had. You're not the prettiest woman. You're not the finest man. No, you're not packing the biggest peanut butter. <laughs> Does that make sense? And so you didn't mean to, to you know, uh, hurt them with the truth, but now they are experiencing insecurity, inferiority complexes, In, and then they 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 begin to think that you're attracted to somebody else. Just because you're not the most attractive that I've been with, it doesn't mean that I'm actually attracted enough to abandon our covenant towards somebody else. Married ladies, it's okay for your husband to look at another attractive woman. Don't be looking at him. You. Say why, ask me why. Because you're not the only attractive woman that God created. It's not what's on you that's going to keep him. It's what's in you. Stop getting mad because what's on another woman is attractive to him. Because he met other pretty women before he married you. He married you for what's on you and what's in you. Remember that you have the authority from God. You have papers. You have the right. Don't let the enemy come in and create a wedge that shouldn't be. When I see a woman that I know my husband finds attractive, I say, oh, babe, look. Because he's stuck with my old fat butt for the rest of his life. So why should I imprison him that, that I'm the only one he can look at? No, you can look at her and admire her beauty and then tell her she's beautiful. And then come on over here and sit down. <laughs> wow. But if you keep fighting over him of the next pretty girl, the way plastic surgery is set up now, and the way Mary Kay is up her game and Mac and 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 Sephora and whoever else, Rihanna's Fenty. You know what I'm saying? A book of wolf would look like a beauty queen. And you mad because he's looking at a book of wolf that's disguised as a beauty queen when the truth is you shouldn't be moved by any of it. And those, the only women that I'm uncomfortable with my husband being around is the trans women. Ooh. No, why? Can I keep it real? Because my gaydar is, is on point. But when it comes to trans women, I'm not always able to measure equally. 
And so they are far more cunning and deceptive than a natural woman. And my husband's not gay. He's not attracted to uh, men, but he is attracted to beautiful women. Most men, most straight men that get caught up with trans men, they're deceived. Ain't no trans women, I call it a trans woman, but if you are born with a penis, you are a man. You're a trans woman. You are a man. Right, you were talking, yes. I was talking about trans women because that's what society calls them. Yeah, that's what they call Does that make sense? Still men. And so what I don't ever do is discard or discredit the power of anything that professes to be a woman. Ooh. Did you catch it? Because if a natural woman is cunning and deceitfully wicked at her core before deliverance, imagine what the imitator is. Wow. Because the imitator puts in twice as much twice effort as the natural woman. Who is this helping? It's helping me keep preaching. <laughs> so I need y'all to be mindful. Y'all worried about the sister with the vagina and she's not the real threat. Because the men that venture over to the trans situation or the homosexual situation rarely ever make it back to what God said. So don't just be praying to, for God to shield your husband from an ungodly attraction to a woman. Also pray for against ungodly attractions to men. Especially African American women because if our men profess any level of attraction towards another man, even if she was the most, he was the most beautiful woman he thought he ever saw. <coughs> we, oh you gay, you did you that. And so there's no safe space for them to be transparent about their real trans uh, attraction. It's uncomfortable and quiet in the room. It's true, though. Y'all listening? Yeah. So let's go back to these questions. Yeah, okay. I was told that you have to know how to cook. Y'all have to do some talking. This is the Lynn Sim show. <laughs> <laughs> you have to know how to cook and catch a good man. But the good men seem to only pursue the hoochies who don't cook or keep things clean. How do I compete? That girl said, learn how to cook. You don't. You don't compete because number one, if he's your man, what you can cook, you can clean, he can go in the world. Number two, you don't compete where you can't compete. I'm like, there's no way I'm out of there. I'm in agreement. You don't compete. Because <laughs> I'm thinking um, your husband or your man already know that you don't, you know, you don't know how to cook. And so when you, you don't have to act like you don't know uh, know how to cook or be, you know, be a, uh, someone that know how to cook, just gotta be yourself. And then if he's for you, then y'all gonna go on. But if he's not, then he gonna go on to somebody that know how to cook. No one has a question. You can always learn how to cook. You can't find it. You can't find another man that's going to care whether you can cook or not. You can always learn how to cook for your man. But you're not going to find that same man that's going to care whether you can cook or not. Right. I've seen a TikTok and Beyonce. She, oh, just her, but she, she said on this TikTok, TikTok, she said, I can't cook. And I she said, she said, I tried to learn, <laughs> but I just can't get the concept. Now at the functions, I just burned the ice water. You got to know what you're anointed for because your That's hands good. may not be anointed to cook. I mean, I, I, I burnt rice all my life. Well, you did. You, your wife now, but before I couldn't get the concept of cooking. It took time, me time in the kitchen, burning rice, burning pots, spending money on pots and 
my mama went and letting it go because I'm like, let it go. They can eat TV dinners and oodles and oodles all they like. I'm so happy to let go because And she wouldn't let it go. So I was, I had to learn how to cook. But if you're rich like Beyonce, you got people to do it. And her husband is cool with it. He like it. He said, babe, she said it. He said, babe, don't bring nothing. You focus on that water and make sure it got ice in it. We <laughs> got people who gonna do this for you. And so I mean, you can't compete. Well, you don't compare. I want to just say, um, the we're talking about for those who don't know, we we are um, talking about the things that women want from men in relationships and the. To go about getting them. I'm Prophet Lynn Sims. This is Prophetess Valerie Singleton. This is Pastor Sequoia Anderson. And so, for those that are watching uh, online, thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thank you. So, my my advice uh, to go about getting what you want from a man, wanting a man who could be very, you know, be very honest. I always wanted to open uh, one of those dating sites. I've been a matchmaker. I've been, you know, people have called me lots of things, but 100% of the people that God has used me to introduce to each other, I tell them, girl, I believe I met your husband. Well, where is he? Oh, he works down at the bus station or whatever. Bus station, you open to it? Yeah, well, come on, let me go, you know, and I'll go and tell him, I believe I know your wife. Yeah. You open to it? Yeah, I thought them, you know, give him my number. They meet, they fall in love, they end up getting married. 100% of those couples are still married right now to this day. So I realized by that track record, I'm anointed for it, right? Don't be deceptive and don't waste time looking a part that you're never going to be able to live. Whatever it is, you want to get what you want to get out of a man, be transparent. First Peter 3, I'll start reading the third verse. I want to show you something. This is the New King James Version. It says, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging your hair wearing gold or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Watch this, verse 5. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Now, the reason I read that scripture is because I'm talking about not only you being authentic and honest with him, but now the next thing you need to do to get what you want from your husband is learn to be submissive. And it doesn't matter how raggedly, raggedy he is. If you find areas to consistently submit in, he'll find areas, areas to consistently listen to wisdom from you in. Does that make sense? So now the next question, unless somebody else had something else they wanted to share. Nope. What kind of sex do men of God prefer? I will just say this. My experience has been the freakiest men that I've ever been with in my life have been men of God. Really? I married a man who had bought his flesh under subjection to the point where he was limited to missionary style only because he was in a ministry that taught against every other kind of sex. There was no oral sex, certainly no anal sex, no multiple positions, none of that. So when he wanted to marry me, well, I was never a part of that organization. And, um, yeah. Yeah, I ain't on no booty play, but some of that other stuff, it was gonna have to be a part of the marriage in order for me to be faithful because I didn't view it as something that would, would be considered a sin against God. Anything that I believe is a sin against God, I'm just not gonna do it. Not intentionally. But if that's not my conviction, I'm liberal and I'm free. And so I didn't want to waste his time. And as good as his missionary is, I, I cannot 
uh, just be limited to just that for the rest of my life. And I don't want to set him up for his feelings to be hurt and for me to be outside the will of God. I want to be married and have all my needs met with one man. I say it all the time. Sex is like oatmeal when you get married. You're serving the same meal in the same bowl with the same fork or the same spoon every time. And I believe that God allows us to add cinnamon or sugar or butter or raisins or walnuts or peaches, whatever, apples, whatever, honey, whatever it is to enhance it that's inside his will. So you can't move outside of your convictions. And you got to know what they are when you come into a marriage because the type of sex that the man wants might not be the type of sex that you desire or that you're okay with. Because there are some men of God that believe that anal sex is not a sin. So what are you going to do if that's what he prefers and it's just not your thing? So you have to have these conversations right up front and find out what the freak number is, find out if there are any fetishes, Find out if there are any deal breakers so you guys don't end up fighting over sex later on in the marriage. We cover sex in the premarital counseling process. We cover credit. We cover medical records. Y'all got to see that stuff before you get married because otherwise you're committing to something that you don't know what. Does that make sense? All right. So. Freaky sex. The lady said what she was gonna say about that. You mind if I just slide something in there on that? If you, yeah. you don't mind. Baby, you are already at the microphone, so we know what's gonna happen and it's gonna be good. I'm just gonna say Give it up, this. Big Daddy. I'm gonna say this. I, I, I find it amazing that when we get saved, when we in the world, we down for whatever. But the minute we get saved, where it's legal and it's where it's in the will of God. We're no longer down for whatever. We're no longer down for whatever. And then it was like, you know, people are confused and bewildered. But I don't understand. We were working so good. Uh, yeah, yeah, because you were down for whatever. So now it's a question of what men of God like. Men of God like what they like. You know, a, a simple, con like you said, a simple conversation will, will solve that problem. But one thing we have to do, one thing Lynn and I have worked on uh, teaching other pastors, stay out of people's bedroom. Stay out of people's bedroom. And you teach what the Bible teach, outside what that is, stay out of people's bedroom. If you stay out of their bedroom, you, you don't cause confusion. And I think of what that, that's what's happened in the body of Christ is, is that we preach so much on sin, and I don't have a problem preaching on sin. I, I'm a believer preaching on sin. But sometimes uh, what we called sin, we didn't clarify clearly what was what made it a sin, especially when it comes to sex. Right. What made it a sin was you were doing it outside of the will of God. That's what made that sex a sin. Now that you are in the will of God, you are free to do whatever you agree to do. You notice what I said, the both of you agree to do, okay? So you guys need to come to an agreement first before you touch half. You need to, under, you all need to have an understanding of how far you're willing to go before you all go, okay? And as, you know, as long as you're not inviting other people into the bedroom with you, you and your spouse, as long as there's not any uh, LGBTQ, IAV, and one, two, three activities going on in the bedroom, you should be fine. Y'all understand what I'm saying? No animals and stuff like that. Y'all should be fine. You better read Leviticus. Bestiality is a real thing. No animals, no, no nothing. You should be fine. As long, you know, as long, you know, again, you know, it's all about a conversation, but, you know, just, just remember, just because you're saved, 
doesn't mean that you can't have sex the way you want to have sex. You can have sex the way it is once you get married. But the minute you have but Lord, until then, you know what the word of God says. That was good. Um, number next, I enjoy stripping for my husband in the privacy of our home, and he enjoys watching me twerk when he takes me dancing. Is that a sin? No. No. The answer is no, and I'm not going to keep expounding on that because I want to get to the questions that pertain to the subject. My husband seems to have become very complacent and content, but my husband seems to have become very complacent and content with where we are financially, and I'm not. How can I motivate him to be more aggressive, assertive, and goal-oriented? I want him to pursue a promotion or a better job or consider opening our own business with me. What's the answer? I would say start the business. Once he sees you started it, he'll step in if he's for you. I say motivate him. Uh, a vision, you know, give him a vision of how you see y'all, uh, the business growing, or how you see him kind of uh, pour into him, and so that he can also, you know, gravitate on it. Because sometimes you don't see it, and so you you tend not to go forward. So I say pour in, you know, write a vision, or sit down and and do a vision board just so a man so that he can see. It. Vision board. I like it. Colossians 3 and 23 in the English Standard Version says, Whatever you do, work heartily. Ask for the Lord and not for men. And then 1 Corinthians 15 and 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable. Always abound in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So, the reason I pulled up those two scriptures is when you're motivating him, make sure that that motivation is in the Lord. Make sure it's tied and anchored to a word that's attached to your purpose. And then talk to him about his dreams. When we first got together, it was, he was just time to make the donuts on his job. Basically working to pay the bills and that is the women, wives, that is the worst position you can ever put your husband in. If he's doing it just because the bills have to be paid, he's got to provide for his family. If you don't work to put him in a position where he can pursue his passion, there will be resentment. When the pressure gets really, really tight, he starts being different towards you. Like I, I know a friend of mine, well, we're not close friends, but a young lady, Heather, she's 34 years old, 35, something like that, been with the guy since she was 17 six months ago, eight months ago, a year ago. He comes home, they have two kids, and he says, I'm not in love with you anymore, and I don't want to be married anymore. And he filed for divorce. Come to find out he's sleeping with the town whore. Oh, wow. So watch this. The burden and the responsibility of being faithful and caring for you and the kids can be a lot. And if the man doesn't have the Holy Spirit to keep him focused, and then, you know, married ladies, those that have been in my coaching for a while, you know, I talk about the power of those five covenant couples. You have to have five godly couples that you are transparent with about the good, bad, and the ugly in your marriage. That you're going to be accountability partners for them. They're going to be accountability partners for you. So he's got a group of men around him to talk him off the ledge when he's thinking about doing something stupid. You've got a group of women around you to talk you off the ledge when you're thinking of doing something that could sabotage everything y'all have labored to build. In the Lord. I want, to, I want you to stay focused on the work that we are doing in the Lord. So it's not good, you know, because there's a lot of money in the strip club. I never got paid in the church what I made when I was in the strip club. Never. I have never gotten paid. When I was in the strip club, I had this one trick. He paid me $15,000 and we never even had sex. He just wanted to talk about his wife and his business and the stress and how his kids don't listen. Yeah. I'm being a counselor. I was an entrepreneur. 
<laughs> I want y'all to get this. We got to look at our men as more than a penis and a paycheck. We got to see them as the person that God is using to lead us in our purpose. I want to say this to you, ladies. Come on, extra panelists. <laughs> I want to say this to you. You guys got to understand, men are not conditioned in this day and age to be visionaries. Right, that's so good. We're not trained or conditioned or raised to be visionaries. We're trained, conditioned, and raised to be providers and protectors. So when you get into a man and he, it seems like he's satisfied with just sitting there and now working a job, that's because he was raised to do that. That's that's because he was raised to do that. So you, 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 you're you going to have to have that conversation about his dreams, his goals, his aspirations. You got, let me tell you also, most men have given up on their dreams, their goals, and their aspirations. Because of the wife and the kids? No, no. because that's how we were raised. That's how mama taught us. That's how daddy taught us. Wow. Why do you think most men, more women go to college than men do? We have no dreams. We're not encouraged to dream. So statistically speaking, most women go to college. Black women outnumber black men in colleges seven to one. Seven to one. More black women are getting their degrees than black men are. Why? Because black men, we're not raised to dream. We're raised to provide, we're raised to protect, not Hold raised on. to dream. Hold on. I believe the other part to that is, because you guys are not the help needs, we are. So we need the education and we need the economic advantage so that we can give wheels and wings and make his vision mobile. No, notice most black men's dream is what is a dream? If it ain't to be entertained, it's sports. So we, if you see a black man go to college nowadays, it's not to be his doctor, it's not to be a uh, anything professional. It's to be an athlete. It's to play football, play basketball, to be an entertainer. That's as far as our dreams go. Most of the time. But most of the time. We're not raising our sons to be doctors, lawyers. We're not raised like, like other races are doing. Hold on, the men aren't, but now some of the women are beginning to move in that lane because when you really get on your face and you seek God concerning the maximum capacity in your husband, because a lot of black women, I can't speak for other races, I'm a black woman. A lot of black women marry men that have great potential, but they never live up to it. Because the woman, only a woman can awaken the king in a man. And so so they don't wake up that potential in them and they don't breathe life to it. He was a $7.50 dishwasher. I had fell into that. I had dreams, but I had fell but into But I want you to know, I, I never accepted the dishwasher. I said, you are not a peasant, you are a king. So why are you settling for a peasant's portion? But it was all that he knew. And he had never been with the woman that saw him as a king. He had only dealt with peasant girls who saw him as a peasant boy. So the palace, the kingdom, dominion, um, servants, staff, all of that was foreign to him. Not because it wasn't God's plan for his life, but because he hadn't connected with the queen <sighs> Next question. Why don't men communicate to their wives when they're getting bored in the marriage? Is she a good listener? <laughs> you don't want to talk to my listener. Will she listen? <laughs> That's good. Will she listen? So if he's not talking to you nine times out of ten, you ain't listening. it's either, either, <laughs> either you're not listening or you respond, you're a loose cannon, and you respond unfavorably. So he's reasoned that it's not wise to tell you what the real truth is because he doesn't want to deal with the fallout and the backlash or the retaliation that may come as a result of that uncomfortable truth. 
And so I want, I'm glad we have a couple of men in the room who are um, chiming in, but it, it's, it's uh, these two or three men's responses have been beneficial because it's confirming, you notice I'm pausing, to give them a chance to chime in before I say what I know because I've been taught. I sit at the apostles, I have an apostle overseer and I have an apostle husband who leads me. And so he's very honest with me about uncomfortable stuff that I don't always like. Next, how do you know if he thinks you're the one? At what point during the dating process or getting to know him process does it become apparent? Day four. Day four. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something. And me and y'all just correct me if I'm wrong. I want to plow through this because all of these are for married women, but I want to get to the ones for the single women if, if time permits. It's this simple. When a man gets a revelation from God that you're the one, he becomes very aggressive. Even the most docile, passive man becomes very aggressive in pursuing you and taking you off the market relatively quickly. He will leave no stone unturned. He is not wasting time. He is not trying to put off getting you. Once he believes that you're the one, you're gonna know it. And it's not because somebody on the outside told you. He's going to make it known to you, hey, like the booty warrior, I like you, and I want you. <laughs> Either way or the hard way. But he's not gonna just go away easily once he believes that you're the one. His sights will be zoomed in on you, and another woman is not an option once he believes you're the woman. Once he finds out that you're the one, the only thing he wants to know is what's the price that I must pay to have you? What do I have to do to make you mine? Men, am I wrong? Okay, thanks. All the men said it at the same time. Next, is it okay for a woman's kids to call her new husband daddy? And if so, when should that begin and how? Let me talk about it. I had that. We had that experience. Mm -hmm. My uh, kids was calling my husband, uh, Mr. Maurice. And so we got ready to get married. I was telling them, I kind of broke it down. I said, well, a mister is someone, you know, you respect him. But when somebody is taking care of you, they no longer a mister. Right. And so and I was, we just talked to them and we told them, well, I told them because I was a mom, I was saying that now we get, we get ready to get married he no longer gonna be a mister because misters don't stay with you. People that, a man that provide for you is no longer a mister. So I, we gave him a chance to come up with names what they wanna call him and stuff, but he's not gonna be a mister. <laughs> and so, did you hear that husband? Okay, He's continue. not gonna be a mister because mister goes and comes. A lot of misters out there. So come on. Misters. Right. That's right. The man down the street could be a mister. That's right. That's right. And so they came up with a, a name, different names, and, and he said, well, I don't know about that. And so they gave him a couple of names. And so they came up with Daddy Maurice. So that's what they call him. They put the daddy in front of his name. Daddy Reese. Daddy Reese, yeah. Daddy Reese. Cause, yeah. And so they put the daddy in front of him. So I was like, we can go with that because he is a daddy. See, mine was the opposite. Um, my husband now, um, my daughter called him Mr. Carlos for four years. And I want her to call him daddy day one. And he said, no. He said, she's 17 now. The most I could ever be is a mentor for her. And if she doesn't view me as daddy, I don't want it to be forced. I said, it's awkward and it's strange because when we're married and she looks more like him than she does me, and then people, she called me, Mr. you know, I had people to question me, you think he's ever touched her? Why is she calling him Mr.? That's weird, that's strange. And I was like, you drawing negative attention. Uh, that you don't want to call him a Mr. Uh, 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 uh. And she was like, well, he ain't my daddy, so what you want me to call him then? I said, call him Carlos. You told me to be respectful and call, put a, put a Mr. or Miss in front of grown people's name. I said, yeah, that's for the people outside of our house. You don't call me Mrs. Mom. I 
I say yes, sir. I say no, sir, to him. I respect for him, but he ain't my daddy. I said, who else you think help me pay these bills around here? So it was a heated discussion, and he came and pulled me, you know, my coattail. So come and let me talk to you for a minute. He said, listen, you're going about this the wrong way. Don't force her to call me anything. It is uncomfortable. I don't like it. But it has to be in her pace and under her terms because you don't have an answer. Because she was like, well, what do you want me to call him in? I ain't have an answer. Because I hadn't thought about it. The only option for me was daddy. <laughs> I had 14 or 15 days. Whoever was paying the rent for my mama, that's who my daddy was. It, it ain't hard, you do the same, fall in line. And she was like, mm-mm. And he said, well, however she sees me is how she's gonna address me. And he said, if I live God before her and I show her the love of a father, eventually it will happen. And I don't remember what happened, but something happened and she asked him, do you mind if I call you dad? And he said, I would love that. Her ex-husband jumped on her. And he and he was a pro wrestler. And my husband, Marine, restrained him, got him off and threw him out the house. Don't you ever put your hands on my boy. And you know what? You know what ended up happening? She ended up saying, Oh, I'm protected. I'm provided for. I'm safe. I'm loved. He's not trying to have sex with me like the other man that I did call daddy. I didn't even put two and two together because the ex-husband, she called him daddy from day one, just accepted it. And he tried to be with her. So now she's not trusting of anybody. So the one that was really protecting her had to prove it to get it. Now if you say he's not her daddy, then you got a fight on your hands. I will you in the nuts. No, you won't. Testicles. Okay, next. I want, I want to try some new things sexually with my husband, but the last time I tried something new, he asked, where did all this come from? And accused me of cheating. How do I address this? Ladies? You should just talk about it. Just say, you know, we want, I want to try something new. You know, and try to explain. Where it come from? Where you get this from? That's Who you been with that did this with well, you? I ain't been with nobody. But well, you been watching from. pornos? Where this come from? <laughs> that will happen. That we will, people be thinking about that kind right. of stuff. Just say, I just want to explore. Your body. She nasty. She, nasty. she talking about, I just want to explore your body. <laughs> she, she all conservative, prophetess by day, naughty, nasty, free by night. I just want to explore your body. <laughs> Absolutely. Have a conversation with him and, and say, I, I mean, I couldn't pull everything out the bag at once with him. He was a good little church boy in my mind, right? So I was like, there's a lot of stuff I didn't want to do with you. I just couldn't tell you because I didn't want you to think I was too nasty and run. <laughs> I said, there's so much more on the list that we have not done yet. So, yes. I got very serious. Dad, you sound scarred. He was. He told me, Lynn, I ain't never heard of some of this stuff. You know, so I had to, when he told me that the first time, I'm like, I ain't even got into, so, you know, let me just ease, ease him out in there. Right? And so what ended up happening was I told him there's a lot of stuff, but I put, I suppressed a lot. Because you were so stunned by what I thought was, yeah, everybody was doing this, the church girls included. I, I didn't think that this was going to be considered freaky, you, you know, to you. But he was like, what? You want to do what with what? And I was like, oh, yeah, let me. Mm. And so tell him the truth. Let him know right up front, bruh. This ain't even the half of what I got in mind for me and you. And uh, if we finna be together forever, all my fantasies, all my fetishes, all my dreams and desires, they gotta be fulfilled through you, player. 
So I'm gonna need for you to just go on over there and grab that Play-Doh and the bunny ears and come on in here. And so, you know, <laughs> and, um, now I'm not gonna keep playing. You know, now I'm not gonna be holding all of this up. Every time I see bunny ears, it's in my mind and my imagination and we could be having a good time. You could be Peter Cottontail and I can help you hop down the bunny trail, you know what I mean? Like, just come on. And so, you know, just so keep- what I'm hearing is, <laughs> don't pull all your tricks out at once. Correct. But have a conversation with him up front. Because if you bombard a man with too much sexually, it can be overload, it can open the door to perversion. A number of things could happen. Because some men, a simple-minded man will be like, I wonder how many dudes she did this week. So now they're stuck. They can't even. They don't feel special. No. That's the first part. Here's the second part. When you do freaky things, keep don't pull out your whole bag of tricks. Don't even let him see the bag, right? Right. Right. one night. Right. No. I told y'all she missed it. I told y'all she missed it. Not in two nights, right? Okay, so what is the time frame? I say quarterly. I say quarterly. So you pull tricks out. Quarterly. Every fruit. Well, what? Right. I'm trying to give you wisdom if you want it. What's your favorite food? What's going on, you guys? What's going on over there? Hello. That's what I was trying to find out. She just accidentally stepped on my pair of tricks here, so I'm sorry. My favorite food is hot. Do you eat them every day? <laughs> but do you eat them every day? No. And because you don't eat them every day, you enjoy them every time you eat them, right? But if you ate them every day and it was the only thing you ever ate, eventually you'd get tired of it. So like around birthdays. Uh, yeah. I, I was I wouldn't say wait for a birthday because a birthday is a whole year. <laughs> I'm just telling y'all what I do. If you want to know, if you're interested, I have reminders quarterly on the calendar on my phone. I introduce new things, the things that he likes. I'll do those new things quarterly. I'll do them every day. I'll do them every week. I'll do them every month. So this quarter, I'm going to do something that I know he loved. And then... Uh, this month and then the very next month I'm going to introduce something else new and then the very next month I'm going to give him the opportunity to introduce something new because I want I don't want to be the only one bringing creativity in our love making experience y'all got it can you pull those curtains for me please is it okay wait my husband controls all the money, and it seems that we're getting broker by the minute. <laughs> Dang. How can I help him to see that we need to try something different? <laughs> What's she saying? You don't know? I would say pull up the budget. Show him, you know, <laughs> y'all budget. First, show him what he's doing and then show him a different route. Don't say nothing if you don't have the answers, because if you're going to make y'all broke up by the second, <laughs> you, don't need, you don't need to, you need to go seek counsel. But I believe if you pull out the budget and sh say, hey, this is this, this is this, this is what we need to be having in bank account at the end of the month or whatever the case may be. So if we do it this way, still allow him or give him a chance to be able to finances but try to give it to him the way that you know it will work. Good suggestion. And what to add to that, um, absolutely, I was saying do a mock budget, but also um, just zoom in on the areas that you believe are deficient with his plan. Don't just throw the whole plan away. Honey, you're doing a great job with paying the mortgage. You're doing a great job with keeping the car payments paid. But I've noticed that the cable keeps getting cut off or the water keeps, we keep getting these pink notices on those two. How about I just take care of paying those two um, every month so you can keep, because you're doing such a great job with everything else. Does that make sense? You're not taking over, you're being a help me. 
And it's not a, anything you can do, I can do better. It's not a team. Does that make sense? Together we win. Um, how do you tell your husband that you don't want to work a job anymore without him thinking that you're just being lazy? I quit. <laughs> this is, I made the mistake in our marriage of not telling him because I was always the breadwinner initially. And, um, <laughs> Yeah, and it scarred him because I became bitter and disgruntled and resentful. I didn't say what you did. What you did was you got jiggly hide on me. Listen, this is what this is what happened. Before we go to work, this happened for two weeks straight. Before we would go to work, early in the morning, we getting ready for work. Good morning, babe. I love you. Oh. And we just loving on each other. We eat breakfast together. It's just all kinds of love going on in the house. The minute we hit the door and start going down the stairs, you blank it blank, blank, the blank, blank, the blank, 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 blank. And then she'll pick me up from work. Hey, babe, how was your day? It was a wonderful day. Oh, I love you. This went on for two whole weeks. And I'm sitting there to myself, like, what? The, the second week, it got really, 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 really bad. It was so bad, I went to the Lord of Bread at my job. I, had, I shut all the doors, locked them. And I was like, Lord, you gotta help me because this woman yeah. drove me crazy. She over here just going off. I mean, off. And we just had such a wonderful morning together. We just in love and her, and then she the whole ride to work. I'm, I'm everything but a child of God, <laughs> for real. The whole ride to work, I'm everything but a child of God. And the Lord, I'm just sitting there getting. I pray my prayer. I'm good. The Lord is speaking to me so clear. She don't want to work no more. Mm. What? She don't want to work no more. Oh, I was hot. I was, oh, I was angry. I was mad. She did all of that because she don't want to work no more. I was mad. I was so mad. She came to get me, pulled me up, and pulled up in the car. Hey, babe. How was your day at work? I miss you. Uh huh. What's the matter? Why didn't you tell me you didn't want to work no more? What do you mean? <laughs> You heard me, you've been jumping on my neck all for the past two weeks. I don't went to prayer about it, and the Lord said, You don't want to work no more. The Lord is a snitch. <laughs> She's like, Uncle, well, hey, I didn't know how to tell you this. I didn't want to burn all the meal you and, 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 and I'm the major grandma. And, and I'm like, Listen, I'd rather have peace, I'd rather you be happy. And not and all the burden be on me than for you to be working and you to, to do this every morning. And you're gonna make life miserable for the both of us every morning. So I said, tomorrow, put in your paperwork. <laughs> Give me your two week notice. Address it or take her. Put in your two week notice. So that's exactly what happened. That's I made her put in my she was like. I asked her, I said, did you put in your two-week notice? Well, no, I forgot. I said, listen, you don't put your two-week notice in, I will. So she, I went to work that day, typed out the letter for her. Uh-oh. Yes, I did. <laughs> so when I got home, I said, she picked me up from work. I said, did you put in your two-week notice? No. I said, okay, I got you. He did it for you? I walked the next day. I walked in on her job with the letter in hand. I said, spoke to her, both of her manager, her manager and her manager's boss, and said, This is her two week notice. And I walked out. Lynn, what happened? The while I heard the shit tell they was like, Lynn, what happened? What's going on? What, what's, what's happening? <laughs> they offered me a raise. They don't want you to know. They thought I was unhappy. Um, 
You were. I, they thought I was unhappy with them. I was unhappy with having to work and carry the load. And because it depended on me, I told you, my, my little sister got it for me because I knew my finances were a huge contribution. It's one thing I've never done. I never, I make more money, I never did this. I knew our money was our money and I was the stronger contributor for that at that time. And when you're in a partnership and the team is dependent on you for a specific part and you can't contribute that part peacefully. So I just had to do in my mind, do what I gotta do because he's dependent but he valued peace more than he valued my pennies. Um, so I would say that's something you need to discuss up front. If you want to be a, a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home wife, uh, thanks, babe. Um, yeah, if you want to be a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home wife, you have to communicate that up front. Because there are men who desire to be providers. But there are some men that want a woman, a partner that's going to work and bring in income. And if you want to be a stay-at-home wife, I don't care how fine he is, how naughty he is, how, how big his feet are, if that's what you're judging by. If he's if he's looking for a woman that's going to work and pay bills for him, y'all are not going to be happy long term. He's going to view you as lazy. Tell y'all something. It's taking everything in me right now to not get up and take my belt off. Cause sometimes with these kids, they need a good old lock in the room. No witnesses. <laughs> Just one. But I ain't got no kids no more. That I don't do that no more. But the boys in this room that are well behaved, they've been in a good old Lock in the room <laughs> one time so with me. Right <laughs> yeah, so and the ones that are just being complete distractions have not experienced the glory of the Lord. <laughs> the love of God. Because the Bible says you beat them with the rod not sparingly. Yeah, it. Evil must be driven out of the heart of a child. Those of you who ain't got no kids, I am a pro corporal punishment parent. Because you see a difference in the kids who don't get hell beat out of them. You are a coach. You are that She beat my baby one time. Look at her. He was like, that's not me. It wasn't me. It wasn't me this time. She don't have no age limit. She don't. No, that 18 year old over there, I get it. Zion, come up here and sit right here, son. Come up here and sit right here. Come up here and sit right here. Come up here and sit You're not in trouble. Look at me. You're not going to get a whooping. You're not in trouble. Okay. He doesn't get in trouble, and he has had that lock in the room. <laughs> no witnesses come to Jesus, and he's ten now. That happened when he was a year old. But as you can see, the fear of God is still there. The blood. <sighs> really not. That was nine years ago. I've never had to beat him again. If you try the evil out of the heart of the child, you will not have to keep continuing with it. But the longer you let it live, the stronger and greater it will become, and the more difficult a time you will have getting rid of it. Am I saying be child abusers? No. I don't believe in child abuse saying, Go up anymore. Everybody heard the statement. <laughs> That's not, no. That's I just said make both those cheeks to me. She said, go in that room. <laughs> <laughs> and 
Lock that door. What God grabbed me. No witnesses. And make sure that the only part on them that's tender now is the cheeks, because it used to be everything. everything. <laughs> you better know. But I don't want to go to jail, and I don't want you to go to jail. But some of y'all need to get you some good old rope and tie them hands to that doorknob. Lock that door. You need to hog tie them feet. And you need to strip them butt naked. And you need to tenderize both cheeks. I mean both cheeks. I don't care if Facebook blocked my video. Both cheeks. Because you don't have to do it forever. If you tenderize me right the first time, every time, it's going to be tender. That's good. That's good. It doesn't become tough again. Once it's been tenderized properly, it is permanently tender. That's good. Proof. Proof. Think I had to whoop her two times, and she'll be, what, 39 in December? Think I had to whoop her two times in her whole life. I don't like pain. <laughs> that booty been tenderized right. Now, so what are some ways? So what are some ways? Oh. The Lord just revealed to me it's a couple of people in this room that said, I'll never be my child. Mm -hmm. I was a gentle parent. If you mind me from people that can, my kids think I'm a gentle parent, but my mama um, told me, my mama and my dad's like, go inside that head. <laughs> and I think that my kids are scared to know. But I have a whole beast mode that I'm trying to avoid. I'm trying to be a gentle parent. Keep being a gentle parent. Don't respond to both. I have been upside all your kids' heads except the oldest one and the youngest one. Well, I, you, I never had. I never had to beat Sherry, and I never had to beat <laughs> Namai. But all the rest of them been in that locked door, closed room, no witnesses, just me, them, and the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> you also learn by watching somebody else get it. Be what not to do. <laughs> Y'all, I feel like I'm the only one talking. What are some ways to get my husband to start praying and studying the word and worshiping? Praying, studying the word, worshiping, and going to church with me. You start the one that God said, sometimes you have to leave. So if he's not strong in the area, you are. You start and he'll follow. And when he follow, and he start doing it, then you begin to follow him. The word of God said a woman, a wife can sanctify her husband. So when she said, you start, you start praying, you start showing him, um, by you starting and you praying and you leading until he start, you want to start leading. Go to first Peter three. I want to show y'all something. And I'm reading this in the NIV. I'm starting the very first verse. First Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that any of them do not believe the word. They may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. And when they see the purity and the reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, healthy and Lord, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah who obeyed Abraham and called them Lord. You are the daughter if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Now, it's very important that you guys understand that it's not what you say to him, it's what you do as you live your life before him. The word conversation in the Bible is translated lifestyle. 
So your conversation that he witnesses, the lifestyle that he witnesses is either going to draw him to God or drive him away from God. So so one of them preached about being so holy in the church and, and, and being raggedy at the house. When you see a man that is in the house with a quote unquote woman of God and he's not growing aggressively stronger in the faith, she is hypocritically living two lifestyles. She's living one thing in front of y'all and she's compromising greatly on her morals of God's standards with God, with him on the other end. So he doesn't have the proper example to know that God is real because he hasn't witnessed or experienced the true authentic power and presence and spirit of God. So when that husband is lagging behind or not coming, a curse, I didn't make it up, it's biblical. A curse does not come without a cause. So for every cause, there is an effect. Do not live one thing in the church and another thing at the house because it's going to show up in your kids and your husband when you do get married. Amen. The women who are living in their home, you can tell because their husbands are showing it in the church. And the women who are not, for those of you who don't, because all our married women, all our married, all of the husbands in this church are present and they're faithful. We don't have a whole bunch, but the ones that are, are present, they're faithful, and we're thankful. But the women in this church are being taught how to not be the hindrance from them getting to the altar. Amen. We're very anointed to draw them closer to God. Amen. Because we are always stoking the flames of fire in our relationship with God. Amen. So if he has to come to the fireplace to have access to me, he can't help but experience the fire. Right. If you're always at the foot of the Father experiencing the fire, he has to follow you. If you don't let him pull you away from the fire, if you draw him to the flame, eventually it's going to burn him. I'll leave that because it seemed to be very deep. I don't think it's deep. I just think it's maybe. <laughs> Do you believe a man or a woman should remain best friends with his or her ex after marrying someone else? Yes or no, ladies? Why not? They have to talk about it. But I say no in the beginning. But um, it depends on if you... You know how long you had the friend and how long he has the friend and if you you've been friends for a long time you your should ex have, your ex husband do, do you believe <laughs> no. a man or woman should remain best friends with his or her ex not after marrying somebody else not just a childhood not just a child that's not the same thing. no i say no <laughs> I, I say no because number one <laughs> just okay just think about it if you're sitting here with your husband now but your ex is in the same room or y'all are still communicating you know how this man touched you you know what Hello. this man have you know you know all of that and you sitting here next to to your husband what if he's not working with it what the ex was working with oh, that's a oh. pull back and let, let's wow. sit here and say, oh, we are holding in vow, but <laughs> you setting yourself up for failure. You set yourself up to cheat on your husband because you know how this man teaches you. You know how he lick what up and you know. <laughs> so why, why even play with yourself like that? I guess you were going to go there. <laughs> um, I have a bit of a different, I agree that it's not safe if it's not solid. It's not safe if it's not solid. Um, but I do not believe that a man can't be friends with his ex. Y'all, hold on, hear me out before I say what I got to say. They're exes for a reason. Something turned them off and broke them apart. That's number one. The ex, especially for me, if they have a longer tenure with them and they know them better than I do, as long as the ex is willing to be friends with us, oh, okay. I'm okay with it. Right. Help me out with you. <laughs> no, no. Um, if, if 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 she's willing to be our friend, 
then then I don't have a problem with that because she may know something about him that I don't know. Here's the third thing. I don't know if that ex is saved or not. And that ex, their sex may have made him an ex just to, for us, for me to have access to her as a wife coach to birth deliverance in her life. So there are many variables that I would look at first before I would just say no. I need to know, do I have an assignment in her life? I need to know, is she okay with being best friends with us? Which means when they're having conversations, if there's a speaker, hey girl, hey girl. <laughs> Some people want their friends to ask for something. 100%. It's an extended family. I need you guys to get this. If they have children together, you don't want to be beefing with your baby mama. Right? Cordy got some, she got to say. But they have the agreement, you know, it's not between them, it's the family. Go ahead. Okay, listen. <laughs> I have been in some situations, okay? So, <laughs> you, as an entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur, so you're saying. Hold on, mama, and, and y'all, for those of you who work here when she preached at 10 o'clock this morning, can we explain what type of entrepreneur you're referring to specifically? I was a hoe. I'm trying to be, you know, I was a, I was a worldly entrepreneur. Okay? <laughs> so when it comes down to that, because yes, yeah, she can be, and I wasn't even thinking about him. I don't feel like my husband gonna come. He's not the one that needs the prayers. It will be me. And you're telling me that my ex, I, now I'm gonna think about how I can get both of them in the bed together. You know what I mean? So if you like me, I, this ain't for everybody. Take the prophetess words. But if you like me and you know you can't handle that, you can't open up doors because it's going to be like, well, he touched me this way. So if I get both of them, and he touched me like this over here. So if I can get both of them in the bed, and then bam, we and all of us in sin because of me and my mind. And no, no, not just nobody. No. No. <laughs> Well, of course, we're referring to women of God who are delivered and set free. And, and you can be a woman of God. One. I was just going to say that. You can be a woman of God. And I, because I have done it. I have had a lot of women of God in my bed. Her and her husband. Ooh. So we can be women of God. And y'all will be in the bed with a person that says she's a woman of God. Right, right. And y'all, me and the woman of God, majority of my sexual encounters was preachers. And wives, uh, first ladies, uh, whatever you want to call it. Not the wives, it. but the bishops. And right, but if the you elders. know, see, I, I want trying to, I want the both of them at the same time. You know what I mean? So if you like me, you can't, you can't open those doors. You've got to understand how to keep so certain. I understand you have kids, but that needs to be something y'all can't be friends. Y'all can still communicate. Let the the two men be friends, but you can't be a friend with them. You can't hang out. You can't do none of that because that's going to open up doors. Oh. That's good. You still got that soul tie. <laughs> that's why we have this kind of discussion. Different perspectives. I'm coming. Different perspectives add value because my perspective may not be the answer that you need or I may not be speaking to your individual need. Whereas what she's saying, so don't just take my because I'm the life coach. Don't just take my perspective. If what she's saying makes more sense for your situation, by all means, follow those instructions. I say, of course, if we're mature and we're delivering and, you know, I can handle it. But if, like she said, if you, if he was um, Tyrone, if he was your Tyrone, you don't need to be friends with your Tyrone now. I didn't consider that option. Here's the, I was going to say the answer to that is, is circumstantial. Yeah. It's really circumstantial. You got to know those that lay one on you. Yeah. Because the bottom line is not everyone can afford to be a friend. That's good. That's so good. You listen, you know, the, the people we're friends with, your ex, we, we, we vetted them. We know his heart. We know who he is. You know, well, my ex is one of them just recently yeah. died, but no, I'm free with all my exes. We know his heart and things of that nature. Close but, with a couple. But then you, there are certain exes you couldn't be friends with. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Man, you got to understand that they just, because especially with men, a lot of men are waiting their time. They're buying their time. And he, he like, is he had to tell me this? I, like, I'm, I'm cool with all my exes. I don't have any enemies except one, and that's because he don't respect boundaries and he's a stalker. But the other, yeah, yeah. But the others, the mature exes, I'm cool with. Them. However, my interaction with them on any level is always determined by his comfort level. So the exes that he's like, you cool? Like if I fly someplace, I gotta preach my ex live in that city, we gonna hook up, we gonna hang out and spend time and catch up and all of that. If he says it's cool, that's what we doing. And we talking on FaceTime, right? We at this restaurant, blah, blah, blah. Hey man of God, they talking to him, they talking to me. But if he said, I'm not comfortable, it don't matter why. I'm not talking to you, I'm not hanging, we're not hanging up, we're not meeting. We ain't doing none of that. I don't need to know why. I'm gonna say this, I would like to say, as a man, <laughs> at any time there's a relationship with another man that you gotta be in their face a little too much, you can call it friend, best friend, or whatever. I don't like it. But for me, you can call it insecurity or whatever. I don't like it. But if it looks something, I might not even say nothing about it. But I'm putting up a boundary right there. Mm -hmm. I'm setting up a boundary because me and you ain't gonna be able to grow deeper because of this. Yeah. At least from one of my feelings is. You gotta communicate. So I let it off. So when I'm seeing something, it's just a sign to me like, okay, maybe she still got something going on right there. Wow. So my my advice would be for anybody, if you have a relationship, value the relationship should be first. It is. The friendship, that should just be on the side. It's so awesome. how can you have a best friend when you got somebody you supposed to my have? My husband is my best friend. That's, That's right. You're supposed to be, it, come on now, y'all supposed to be one. Mm -hmm. So y'all supposed to be knowing everything about each other. Why y'all going to bowling? You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, why y'all need to go fishing together? I'm with him. No, we ain't going bowling and fishing now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Why y'all hanging out? That you know what I'm saying? I hang with my exes. Let me, let me, let me be very clear. <laughs> I hang with my exes. They're preachers. We have lots of mutual people because I ain't had no fly-by-night relationships. So anybody that I was with, I was with them for years, and we know all the same people, including him. They're not strangers to him. He's not new in my life. We all already knew each other. And any man, so I, I hope I made that clear, any man that he says, I'm not cool, we don't have to talk about it. They're not invited. But the ones that are friends are friends with me. Hear me. If he's not cool, ain't no phone, ain't no hang out, ain't no nothing. But if they got wives or they got girlfriends, they talk to me as a wife coach, they talk to him and get advice. So I'll hang with them or their female counterparts. It's not just them, so we're clear. Because we are all friends. It's not a separated situation. I don't believe there should be any friends. I don't have any friends that are not guys that are not friends with him. Period. I don't. One that can be friends with the man that don't do ten years. No, that's the no. We don't do that. Just like he said, we, this marriage is more important than any other relationship except our relationship with God. And so anything that could potentially be a threat or bring stress, we just don't do it. The only reason I have that freedom and the only reason he has that freedom is because these are people we knew before we were a couple. He knew the nature of my relationship with my exes before. They were my exes and we were friends and we were cool when I was a single woman and there was no romance. He worked with me for a year and a half, so he was able to see wasn't no booty play, wasn't no hanky-panky, wasn't no inappropriate conversations. He knew their character, he knew mine. So that created a safe space for him. But the ones where he wasn't sure, even if I didn't see it, I just viewed it, okay, this is something in my blind spot that he has 20-20 for. Ladies, if your husband doesn't like it, it's usually for a reason. Just don't even kill it right now. I, there is nobody that I would not cut off for my husband. My biological child, child that I carried in my womb, I love her. But if I got to choose between him and her, she already knows she's dust. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> I, 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 I know I had to break me up in there. I already know. That's why I had to get my own husband. <laughs> That's right. And I believe that if you got to choose between me and him, I'm dust. That's the way God would have it. Did you see her blow the dust? You know, 
That's how it's supposed to be. It's okay to love. I love, we love each other. But God's hierarchy is the only thing that's going to stand inside his will. Yeah. And the covenant that God wants you to honor first on earth is that with your husband and the wife. Not the kids, not the mama. Everybody comes secondary to us. I'm coming to it right now. We're on the same page. Yes, Sheba. What's your question? <laughs> You remember a lot. Quit playing. What's the question, Joker? Back to you, Sequoia. Uh, Sequoia. I'm sorry, I'm bad at name. Um, so you said that you you to speak with the uh, with preacher people, right? You know, back in your time, and you don't want to be clear with your exes. Do you still have that desire? Do you feel like your flesh is dead and your spiritual is lying? Because I think it's a, it's, I think it's a choice. Are you asking me? Do I still struggle with that? Like, do you still struggle with it today? Because you you just talked about it. I do. I, I I have the desire. I mean, it comes up. It was a past. I have the desire to sometimes be with women, sometimes be with men, sometimes be with both. But like I said earlier, I have accountability partners. So when I get, because it's not going to leave because I'm in the church now. That's so but funny. when I get those desires, I, 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 I pick up the phone. And I, the sisters ain't like me back in the day. I ain't like them. <laughs> At least I thought. So they could be my accountability partners. But now that they like me and I like them, so I didn't think. So now that I know that I pick up the phone and I be like, hey, it's been asking. They in this room. It's been times my mama. It's been times I didn't said, hey, I'm thinking about going, you know, to snack on some carpet, and she was like, huh? Uh, yeah, like the desire is here. The desire of being in a lesbian relationship. The desire of being, you okay, know. Pause. Pause. Let me uh, let me add to that. Here is here is here is what I believe is most important: transparency, because the enemy breeds and reproduces in those undisclosed places. That unconfessed sin is where we get trapped. And so I don't want anybody to condemn or judge her for being honest. She is a single woman, unmarried, who is practicing celibacy. So when you have not had sex of any kind and you are a hypersexual individual who have been open to sex of every kind. Entrepreneur. <laughs> and you were a worldly <laughs> entrepreneur. <laughs> the enemy has many doors that were once open that he can keep knocking at. And so for those of you who've never been bound by sexual perversion, I want to bring you right into this room and give you an understanding. When we're sitting in this room, we see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight doors in this building, right? When you are bound by sexual perversion and you've opened up yourself to every facet of it, threesomes, orgies, menage trois, masturbation, pornography, um, lesbianism, um, anal sex, Everything that you can possibly imagine. And some other things I dare not name because I don't want to open doors. That's just the basic stuff, right? Those are these eight little doors. But sexual perversion has about five to 10,000 doors. So it's now the building. Because now you have fetishes and you have fetish rooms and you have webcam and you have uh, um, pedophilia and you have incest and you have uh, uh, hermaphrodites and then you have uh, bestiality and you, you there are so many the oh. fantasy realm yes and so you have sex exploitation on multiple levels and then you've been the prey and you've been the prey so if you can even, well, s and is just, that's light. That's a lot of people deal with s and but very few people, you know, do blood rituals before sex. And very few people, you know, do, I don't want to open any doors, but I want you guys to understand that the demonic realm is vast. It's almost as vast as heaven. Everything that Satan has done has been to duplicate what God has done. So just like there's room for you in heaven, the enemy makes room for you in hell. And sexual perversion is one of those great effectual doors in the demonic realm. So picture the whole complex. 
of doors. If you count every door in this whole business complex, you have hundreds if not thousands of doors. So with sexual perversion, it's super hard to close every door. Now envision one person only. There's an army that's beating at every door to, to bombard you to get in. And one person only is responsible for standing behind every single door and keeping all those doors closed. I'll give you another example for those who haven't been bound by it. How many of you have had been on a real absolute fast, no food? So you will understand this. You're on the, because those that fast on a regular basis can typically make it to about the third or the fourth day before they really, really, really get a little weak. So you're on day four and you are locked in a room where there is nothing but your favorite meals being prepared. Mm. And everybody around you is eating your favorite stuff. And every time you breathe, which is what you have to do to survive. Right. <laughs> Everything you're inhaling smells like something you thoroughly enjoy. And you can't leave. And you have to stay strong day after day after day after day when your flesh has not been nourished because sex for married people is another form of nourishment and strength. Yes. So you have tension and you have pinned up passions and you have the temptation. Sexual cravings and urges are like uncontrollable appetites when you are starving. You have anything in four days. You normally don't eat fish, but that's the only thing that's before you, which is a vagina on vagina situation. It's some level of gratification. And if you've ever experienced pleasure, great pleasure in the perversion, now you're addicted to that which is perverse. So you gotta walk out the door of deliverance and the door of temptation for same sex attraction. So it don't matter how much you preach and teach and how much you study the Bible and how much you pray, the enemy never stops bringing sexual perversion before you. So the question, the answer to your question is that door, the temptation will always be there. So she has to fight every day. I view sexual perversion like the grass in front of my house. Because there are certain seasons where that grass has to be cut every six to seven days. And then there are certain times of the year we can go two months without cutting. Mm, that's good. But if you remember that your deliverance from sexual perversion requires ongoing maintenance for the rest of your life, you don't have to ask anybody who was bound by it. Do they ever still get tempted? Well, the deliverance doesn't mean that it's not ever before you. It only means that you are making, like you said, the decision to consistently not act in that activity. That's why people fall back into it. They have walked through the process of deliverance, but something along the way tripped them up enough for them to stumble back into it. It doesn't mean that it's, I, I, I still can smell smoke at times. I can smell marijuana in high stress situations. That doesn't mean that I'm not delivered from it because I don't go through the process, but there's times where I have to literally be like, I told Rice, I think like last week or the week before I said, oh God, I want to smell so bad. I told the woman, I was like, I want to get high so bad. But it's not that I'm not delivered from it. It's just that there's something that's tickling that dead piece of me that wants it to be resuscitated. But just like my husband, I have to remember to let the dead bury the dead, that that is behind me and belief and make a decision to continue to walk out this life and where I'm at right now. It's the same type of situation. I want to be very clear. I want to be very, very, very clear, Sheba. Um, when you run into people with these types of testimonies, it takes a lot of courage to share them because the people sitting in the pews or in the chairs are usually judgmental. They're usually self-righteous and they're usually condemning um, the person that's confessing. I was just thinking Hold on. I, but we have to learn as believers to not flip the script just because the finger's being pointed at us. 
We have to just take these moments and educate so the enemy cannot continue to infiltrate. Or cause confusion, because sometimes people will take these questions the wrong way and think that something is going on that's not. Right. Yeah, I just said, I'm not judging, because you know, I'm not perfect either. So I was just, I just asked you a question. I'm just a curious person. So it wasn't like, oh, yeah, well, I wasn't was thinking about you. No, it's not about you. No, no, no. We stream our videos live. There are people who watch, and there are people who, that's the, this is the first time I've ever put the Wife Life Bootcamp out. This is all of them are private because of the nature of these discussions and the nature of the messages and the church is more critical than the world will ever be. Right. Even though you're dealing in truth and we're taking a long period of time to address these issues in our tissues because the, the average church doesn't deal with them. If they do, they sort of skate over them. Right. And usually I'm not saying you ask the question to judge her, but nine times out of 10, when that question comes, it's usually attached to judgment. So that's why I have to deal with judgment. Does that make sense? You're her sister. I don't think you're here to crucify her, but those that are watching are not her sister. And they will lynch you. I am the poster child for sexual perversion. I go to strip clubs, I go to brothels, I go to webcam houses, I go Whatever perversion, casino, or whatever perversion is, you will find me there. I'm not ashamed. I've been to porn conventions. I've been, and everywhere I go, I can't, the bad part about it is I can't take my team with me. She's the only one that I've ever, in this ministry, taken with me to minister at the strip club. That's so <laughs> I can't take anybody. Because people want to go, I just want to see you in action, woman of God. You can't go. We have to be on assignment. <laughs> yeah, I just want to go to see how you do. I want to see what it's like. Well, maybe they're trying to start their own. No, they're going to go in there and see all that booty and cootie and get caught up into something. And they say, you know, they're bound by same sex attraction. So that's the same reason I can't take certain ones here. God has spoken to me. You can't take my husband, 20 years. He has never stepped foot in the strip club with me. Said, I 20 said, years. Ready. I said, I think I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let y'all be watching the whole, I have a whole collection. <laughs> I do not. I know that. I know that. You got it? <laughs> that I can't help you. <laughs> no. You have to know to thine own self be true. I don't know how we got stuck right here, but I, I've moved with the flow of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And I want you guys to understand that when you see somebody that has a mantle, they're mantled, my God, in an area that you have not been touched with that infirmity, if you don't do anything else, pray for them. But don't join in with the mob mentality. I've been called everything but a child of God. The same preacher that married us told my husband, you're never gonna be successful if you stay married to her. Wow. It's not. I just want you to understand how the enemy works through people when they have flesh moments. So I keep these typically as a safe space. You catch people on mad day, you find out what they really think about you. The same preacher that married us asked me in front of my husband, where were you when I was looking for a wife? See these three different things coming from the same source? I don't think the man wanted me. I think he wanted some of my character traits in his own life. I don't think that man wanted to sleep with me. If he did, oh well, I, I don't I think so. I didn't say your coochie. I said he wanted some coochie, that general coochie. I don't know the man to be a whore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the man to be a whore, and so I don't want to let that float out on his character. I don't believe he'll cheat on his wife. I, he's human, but I don't believe he said before he had a wife, you always have these men that want you and you never see the fact that they want you. Right. You and never his wife was not sleeping with, no, his wife was not sleeping with him. So no, I, I agree with you. You don't have to be a whore or have the character of a whore, but if you starving and you hungry mm. and you're not having sexual support, then you ain't <laughs> you know, where you want to go. Well, he did confess later that they had gone about seven months with no sex. So I, that's the reason why I don't think he wanted me. I think he was deprived in that moment 
She wasn't coming to church a lot. She wasn't supportive. They're happy now. Y'all still on Facebook? They're yeah, happy. They're, they're in love. I, I, even when he was vulnerable, I don't think he was cheating. I heard people, oh, yeah, I don't believe that. Oh, he's a whore. He's sleeping with the woman in the church. I don't believe that. My, 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 I can vouch for the man's integrity when it comes to money and booty. Now, the rest of the stuff, I don't know. I didn't say he fell into something. I said he wants something. You can want something and not do it. And not do it. I stand by the statement. The man wants something. That's a statement cool. about deliverance. Next question. All right, let's go to the next question because I don't want to put that out there on the man. I don't, you know, if I thought it, I thought it. But if I didn't, I didn't. Um, I, I don't, it, it may have been, but. I don't think that man thought twice about me. All right, so why would men rather spend time with their friends? So you know, many people have told me that he did. I, you know, but why do they spend time? <laughs> but I don't want to. <laughs> Y'all don't put that out there on that man. I don't want that. That man, that man that put that out there on himself. You put the blanket over it, and so why? And you you've been right. Him? You already done addressed it. You said what you think. The people done said what they think. You done said it. You done let yourself be out there by making the statement to you now. You done said what you said. They said what they said. We spending time with who? <laughs> Why would men rather spend time with their friends at a sporting event than to spend quality time with their wives or children? Because they want it. <laughs> he want peace. He need the time. He want the freedom. And when you come, when he come home, you're nagging why why he left his drawers on the floor why the toothpaste so he needs that that's his downtime that's his time to unwind and if he can't do it at the house what else he gonna go you better be lucky he with his friends or not with stephanie or stefan or stefan uh, <coughs> did you have some more you want to add <laughs> <laughs> what the heck? Because you don't like sports and he's got to watch it with somebody. What do I always teach in my wife coaching classes? If you don't know anything, pick two sports and learn them. So you have something to discuss. The most popular state sports in the state. If you want a farm man, you need to learn soccer and track and field. If you want an international man, cricket, right? Soccer, track and field, cricket. Learn Two out of those three. You want to date a man that's American, you need to learn football, baseball, yeah. basketball. Pick two of those. Am I wrong? You ain't wrong. Y'all got it? Just I love this. Learn the game and pick a favorite team. And you know what? Yes, hold on one thought. One second, you will. He was a Bucks fan when we met. I was always a Cowboys fan. Oh, yeah. Cowboys. Cowboys. 100%. <laughs> but when we got married and we lived in Florida, when the Bucks would play, I would put on the Bucks jersey and I would cheer for the Bucks. But I told him when the Cowboys play, I need you to put on a Cowboys jersey. He's like, I just can't do it. I'm a Bucks fan for life. So when we moved here, because we started working the stadium, before I did, before I did, I gave him four years. <laughs> And I told him, we riding, because we work the concessions. I'm going to come back to you. We work in the concession stands. We work in all the Cowboys game. I'm seeing these handsome black men suited with this Cowboys gear on, cheering for my team. I'm seeing these couples dressed in the gear. He be in the back in the kitchen. I'm on the register. Every time I see a black couple, baby, he has to come what? I'm making these nachos, what? Look at them. That's hashtag couples goals. <laughs> And then I started being drawn to the men wearing the Cowboys jerseys. And I came back and I told him, I said, I'm finding myself more and more attracted to these men in these Cowboys jerseys. I don't know if it's demonic. I don't know what it means. But I'm going to need you to put that Cowboys jersey on. He said, okay. He went and bought one. And that same attraction I had for them, it went right over there to him. And I said, how does sports play a part? The enemy will use anything to divide you. And I'm telling y'all, if your spouse is saying they want to see it on you, put it on you. What's your question?
Well, like, baby. I, I wouldn't want nobody like me. Like, I like somebody like the opposite of me. You know, you know, like the balance. Opposites do attract, and you bring up a good point. But you need to be with a man who has that desire. A man who has a need to be with his friends needs to have a woman like you who doesn't mind him getting that need met. My husband is the opposite. I said, man, you, you, don't, you don't hang out with your friends. You don't do this. He said, you're my best friend. He said, if I want to watch a sport game, you're going to pop some popcorn and we're going to watch it together. I don't have a need for outside friends. Love them. Appreciate them. But just go hang, up, hang out with them and you're not going to be there? He said, I can't think of any circumstance where that's okay. I need that. I love my wife. You're my best friend. We have a great relationship. We get along well. I enjoy spending time with you. Why would I give up my best friend where I know I'm going to have a great time to go hang out? I'm going to be doing this thing about you and where you at and what you're doing and what we could be doing together. So why waste their time? I'm not going to be of any good use to them. Pushing him to do the men's ministry in the church, they meet for two or three hours. It's been a push. I said, honey, the men need you. I preach, not teach, but they need you. Right. Dad pops. And he comes. Um, my husband is constantly coming home late, texting when he thinks I'm sleeping, making late night trips to the store, having private phone conversations with friends that either I don't know or have heard of, but have never met. <laughs> <laughs> I believe he's cheating. What do I do? <laughs> if it walk like a duck and a quack like a duck and it look like a duck and it's yellow and it swims around in a pond and it's furry, it's a duck. <laughs> <laughs> if you like cheaters, you stay in the relationship with him. And if you can't handle being cheated on, then you get out of the relationship with him. Because you talking to him, if he's, listen, let me tell you about cheaters. Men don't always cheat because they're a whore in the heart. Men usually cheat for a reason. They've been invited. They're being treated well by her, not being treated well by you. She brings peace in their atmosphere. You bring the bills and the stress of the day with the kids. She's slapping up, flipping it, rubbing it down, slobbing sloppily. And you don't want to do mm. it. <laughs> you super holy and she's super ho-ish. And sometimes even the most conservative man wants, he wants you to be a lady in the street. Entrepreneur that night. Y'all got it? So, uh, yeah, what you do is decide can you handle what's going to come behind the confrontation? Don't be confronting him on why are you cheating on me if you can't handle Because you done let yourself go. You done got too fat and it's kind of smelly when I go down there. And she keeping the, the fish uh, fresh on Fridays. Wow. Don't open the door that you can't handle what's behind it. What you do. So you can confront them if you want to, but be prepared for the truth. Because most men, if they love you, they're going to lie to you to spare your feelings. Yeah. But when you say, tell the truth, I can handle it. Tell the truth, I can handle it. Well, the truth is, I'm tired of coming home to this house dirty, no hot cook meal. The kids look like don't nobody love them but the Lord. And then you got your hand out for some money. Your hair nappy, your nails busted, your tail stink. What are you doing with the money? <laughs> the real reason I'm cheating on you because you don't know how to talk to me. When I'm telling you what's on my heart, you ain't listening. Your mouth is thick. You covered your words. You disrespectful. You dishonorable. You submissive in the church to the pastor, but you don't do anything that I'm saying. And then if I do say something, I'm the bad guy because we are surrounded by people that were our advocates for you. Okay, that's enough. No, it's not enough. You want to know what to do. I am the voice. I am a man with a female's body parts. My husband said, you got the, the strongest man's mentality of any woman I ever met. 
Because I love it. I don't have to guess what you're thinking. I'm cheating on you because I got to guess what you're thinking. Because you drop hints and you talk in circles and you lie without a conscience. I don't lie to you. Yes, you do. When I say what's wrong, nothing. You just lie. Are you good? I'm good. I'm fine. You just lie. Why your nose twist up like you smelling a fart? Like, what we doing? So now here's the last one. The real reason I cheated on you is because with her, I can get it however I want it. It ain't no, I ain't got to beg and plead. I ain't got to do no massages. I ain't got to buy no roses. I ain't got to do no long, sweet talk. I ain't got to listen to how her day was. She ain't interested in telling me about her day. When, she, when I come around her, she interested in hearing what is going on in my day. She got a whatever you like mentality. And you got a ain't no way in hell mentality. <laughs> Do you really want to know why I cheated? I don't have to work for it. I got to practically beg you. And I work and pay bills and take care of you. I got to practically beg you to get the bare minimum beside booty action. She doing tricks. She putting on lingerie. She oiling things and spraying stuff and waxing stuff and plucking stuff and making stuff fresh. Her presentation, she prepares for me. She straightens up her house when she knows I'm coming over. You comfortable just letting it be any kind of way when I come? You really want to know why? Y'all ready for the next question? Yes, next question. Next question. <laughs> oh, yeah, next question. She said, I don't know. <laughs> what is the proper way to respond to your husband's ex if she's purposely manipulating him with their children to get him back or to get more money from him? Would that trick? Oh. <laughs> One said, with that trick. One said, shoot her in the kneecap. Y'all want to know what I did? You loved her. <laughs> Above and beyond. And I gave her more money than the child support order. And I bought the kids' school clothes. And I bought the kids' school supplies. And I bought all the Christmas presents. And I sent letters. And I sent gifts on birthdays. Even when he wasn't even, he was so done with her. I paid us up $14,000 a head on child support. When the kid, the baby turned 18 years old, we paid child support, the son, until he was 20. Two years extra, because she was broke, and she my baby mama, and I know she's struggling, our kids struggle. So that when they became adults and they looked at public record, there would be proof that their dad was not a deadbeat, and there was no lie she could tell to cover it. Does that make sense? My job is to always shield him first. Was it easy? No. But when we are daughters of Zion and we're representing Christ, the love of God has to be present even in those hard places. I was every kind of fat bee. I was the worst thing under the sun. But you know what? I was also the one cutting them checks. She was calling, they finna cut off my lights. And I, and he said, no, I ain't got it. She'll pick up the phone and call me. She know I was gonna get it from somewhere. I don't know if I with you. you got it. Make sure that the enemy has nothing he can use against your character. Don't even let your be dead to your emotions. When it comes to that baby mama, be dead to your emotions. Take away every access she got to him. Because if you provide money every time and you making sure the stuff is there delivered to her door. She ain't got no reason to really talk about him. And you remind him, hey, this was graduation. I need you to be there. Hey, this was the, the birthday. I need you to be there. What's she got to have access to him for? Run interference. But do it the godly way. With clean hands. My husband wants me to do some things sexually that I just don't believe in. Next question. Do you believe in him? How do I avoid doing it without him accusing me of depriving him? Let him get it from somewhere else. Does it depend on what it is? Because it is like three songs and animals. Then that's not biblical, so it depends, right? I don't think it depends. Y'all know what our premarital process is. And when we do premarital counseling, we deal with sexual preferences and fetishes up front. Yeah. Before we put our 
we need to talk about this. What are your sexual preferences? What are your fetishes? What are your expectations? What do you believe? What is your sex cycle? What are your needs? Because some men need sex seven times a week. Some men need sex seven times a day. Some men like oral sex, anal sex. Some men like toe sucking. Some men want their toes to be sucked. You have to deal with the fetishes and the preferences up front so nobody's blindsided going into the marriage. Anal sex was a deal breaker for them. No, it's a good break. It was also one for him too. Yes. <laughs> okay, so how would okay first people Ecclesia. who are virgins, right? Ecclesia. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, um, for the people um who are virgins and they never experience you know their sex preferences or anything and they are getting married, but how would they know? How would you introduce them to be able to determine what their sex preferences or their fetish if they never tap into that because you know they were trying to keep their stuff two reasons two reasons two ways first of all two virgins rarely marry each other really? rarely virgins almost never marry other virgins virgins always not always most virgins christian virgins give their virginity to someone who has sexual experience opposite to tract God, if it's of God, the weaknesses of one will be staffed in the other. So one will have knowledge. Now there are ways that you research. And the virgins that we have dealt with, we have them to go through the process of sex education to understand how orgasms work, to understand all of both, both sides, both body parts, and to explore with physical touch before they enter into sexual intimacy. So you have to coach virgins differently than you coach people with sexual experience in a marriage, in a premarital counseling situation. You have to teach them the art of physical touch first so they can ex explore just the touch. I'm not anything weird, but teaching him how to touch her, where to touch her, letting him know most women like to be touched in this way or this way or that way. So when you give him three or four options, he can now try all four of them on her without them going to sex to see which one her body responds to. And she can say, oh, I like this one. She then, hold on. She then does the same thing. I'm coming back to you. She then does the same thing in return. Oral sex is optional. Anal sex, again, we teach against it, not for biblical purposes, because if you're not convicted, you're a husband or wife, and that's what you want to do, I don't believe you're going to hell for having, you know, to do it, but we don't promote it for medical reasons, because of the medical ramifications. That's why we don't support anal sex. However, we're not going to condemn somebody to hell if that's what the husband and the wife agree to. I, we don't have dominion in their bedroom. So our obligation to a person that has no experience is to educate them on all their options. So they at least have a starting point. Does that make sense? And then we teach them safe ways to explore according to the Bible, according to what we believe. And so we explain to them no animals, no outside individuals, no pornography. I know you're tempted to watch the pornography to, in, in your mind, learn something, but that is a demonic exposure to contaminate your eye gate, right? So we have to teach them what to steer clear of and those safe boundaries in which they can explore. That's the first thing. The second thing we then do is answer every question that they have in front of each other and individually. So the women will ask me questions that they're not comfortable asking in front of their husband or my husband. And the men will do the same. And so my husband has to then educate the man on everything. Contalingus is an art form, and if a man doesn't know what he's doing, it, it will frustrate you to death. Contalingus. Fellatio. Oh. oh. <laughs> I'm okay. Sorry. Okay. 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 Okay and our experiences, and we encourage them to try it unless the Lord forbids them from doing so. Anything, that's why we tell them they have to pray before they make love to each other so that the Holy Spirit can then make their body, our body's instruments of pleasure for our spouse inside his will because we want him to be glorified even in our love-making encounters. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
So there's a lot more education and there are a lot more steps involved when, the, when it comes to introducing the sex piece in a marriage between people who are virgins. But typically there is one person who is already experienced on some level and we spend time teaching them how to be patient, how to be understanding, and how to gently ease their spouse into the lovemaking experience in a manner that's going to make it tailor-made and customized to fit their individual needs inside God's will. Did that answer your question? Okay, come on, it's found. Oh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I have friends that, you know, who are virgins and stuff like that, so I was kind of curious, so I was like, what would they do for them? But, oh, I have another question. I'm coming to you after her. Now, I don't know, like, this is more of like a question that is this is like acceptable for people. Um, I guess once you get married or whatever, and you kind of like, for instance, for a female who wants to learn how to do a certain thing, like ride. Okay. Uh, and I know there have, I've seen like on social media, like some classes that can teach you, like a woman will class. Is that okay or that's not okay? 100%. Here's what I do. Here's what I do. In these Wife Life boot camps, normally when there's nobody else, when it's just he and I, um, I facilitate classes. I teach them how to dance for their husbands. So there are twerk lessons for only the married women or the women who are engaged. And I mean, their wedding day is like this week. Um, I teach fellatio lessons. Because if they have to go anywhere on social media, there's going to be pornography attached to it. But with me, I'm praying to give them a skill that's going to gratify their husbands for the rest of their lives, right? So I teach them three or four different methods or techniques, and then they figure out which one he responds to or he prefers, and then they master that skill, that technique. Does that make sense? So learning how to do anything better for your husband is always wise as long as you're doing it in an environment that's God ordained. I only teach those things to married women. So of course, y'all see my Meg the Stallion knees and all that. I only teach those <laughs> things. I only teach those things to married women. Because if you don't, if you open it up to just anybody, the enemy comes in and he can bring perversion. Every man wants something different. Guarantee you, whoever your husband is, he's not going to be attracted to my old fat butt, right? So I am a safe place for you to learn. I've been having sex since I was 12 years old. So you got over 40 years of experience that you're getting for free. So now he doesn't, what's wrong? Mama, why? <laughs> oh, oh, I knew, I saw that. So, so yeah, so, so, yes, it's okay to learn different positions. Yes, it's okay to enhance those skills, but make sure you're doing it with a woman of God who is happily married, so there's no room for those unclean, who is delivered, so there's no room for the unclean spirits to transfer onto your life as a result of that connection. Does that make sense? And what was your question, Bree? <laughs> okay, what's your question? Okay, you said that um, you don't think it's going to change, but I think people can start to change sexually. I think that sometimes people start out liking something, and over time, it starts to gradually like I didn't something. say what would change. You said, you, I said, you said it doesn't depend, not what would change. You said it doesn't depend. I said it depends on what somebody likes at that time, because some things that are sinful, some people might want it. Oh, okay. I think I misunderstood what you were saying initially because, uh, and, and she brings up a good point. Your husband's sexual desires will change over time. And the things that used to do it for him will kind of grow boring or dull. And so uh, I'll say this and then we're going to wrap, well, we won't wrap it up. I'll get to two questions for the singles because we spent this whole time and now our time is up. Um, I'll, I'll say this, when, if you view your marriage, married women, as the, like you do the weather, seasonal, there's gonna be a winter in the marriage. 
when everything is cold, it's frozen, nothing's growing, nothing's flourishing, it's uncomfortable for the whole season, you may or may not know why. Communication is strained or finances are strained or family dynamic is strained or stress or exhaustion and fatigue. You're behind on the bills so everybody's working two jobs. All kinds of stuff happens. So when that winter time comes, you don't get to dictate what type of duress your marriage is going to be under. Just know that it is assigned, not by Satan, but by God. Because the winter time is what forges growth in the marriage. When, yes, because when stuff is frozen and there's no benefit for you, you're forced to become disciplined. You're forced to become sacrificial. You're forced to become more of a giver because none of your needs are being met in that season. So then, I don't know the chronological order of the seasons, So, but I'll still go through the other three. In the summertime, everything is hot and spicy. Spring and summer and fall. Okay, so let's start with spring. Everything is flowing, everything is growing. The birds are chirping and the bee is peace, is happiness, is key, key, key. Y'all are in that spring phase. Everything is mm, mm, and mm, 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 mm. And then the summer comes, right? And when the summer comes, everything is hot and spicy, but sometimes it gets sticky and uncomfortable. <laughs> and so where you work in the wintertime, you need a little space because it's hot. I love you. I want you. But under some air conditioning, there are conditions that begin to come into play in the summertime that are needed for comfort, whereas in the springtime, you don't need AC and you don't need a fan and you don't need a heater. All you got is each other and that's enough, right? So then you go into your winter season or your fall season. That's when stuff that was green begins to turn brown and yellow and orange and die off and fall off and you don't even know why you don't even know how you just woke up and the leaves you looked out and those leaves all over the ground and no matter how many of them you 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 rake up it's it's more leaves that just keep falling and it keeps being brown there's nothing green anymore no matter what you're doing the same things you're putting in the same amount of work but it's just like it's like everything is dying and you think it'll be a lifeline after that but no you go right on into it <laughs> It just dies on you, huh? Right. And what was dying then becomes dead. And now you got to make those donuts when there's nothing in it for you. You're not being spoken to the way that you like. You're not getting the type of sex you like on the, as often as you want it. You're not getting those back rubs and those foot massages like they did when they first got you. You're not getting cooked for and catered to. And I love you. And they're not talking to you all night on the phone until you go to sleep. And, and you're not getting any of that. What you get is, oh, you left the top of the toothpaste again. Why did you leave the toilet seat up? Your car is blocking me in. I asked you to park on the side. You burn all the gas out of my car again. Why don't your clothes go in the dirty hamper right there? Do you have to leave a plate right there? The sink is 10 feet. You keep passing the turn. It's right there. You can't drive from the side. You want to drive? <laughs> there are seasons is what I'm saying listen to me there are seasons and so we try to prepare people for all seasons so when it comes you already know when you wake up and you see your yard full of green and orange leaves oh it's the fall season. I better buckle up in my prayer life. It's the fall season. I better step up in my sex game. It's the fall season. I got to stay focused and not and be hypersensitive so my, for my ability to hear what he's saying now because I'm expecting him to be in the mood. I'm expecting his tone to be different. And I still got to respond with love and patience and submission and humility. I still got to go beyond. And when he talks to me crazy and when he's not focused on my need, I still got to perform. I still got to produce. So when you take on that mentality, when the fall comes, you'll breeze right on through it because you focus. And then when you wake up and it's six inches of snow outside your door, in the wintertime, you prepared, you bought those heaters. You got those snow shovels. You were already prepared. You had blankets. You had mittens and boots and coats. Oh, it's time for me to reach out for these coats, extra love. It's time for me now to make some stew. 
Because if I don't make him something, he's going to go out there, he's going to be in the cold, he's going to be deprived, he's going to be having all the discomfort. But if I prepare to create ease for him in the wintertime, he'll create ease for me in the fall. Is that like what she was saying with that sweet note, not two people being weak at the same time? That's, that's exactly what she was talking about last night. So one spouse can be in the winter, be strong in the winter, and the other one's strong in the fall to keep the marathon. So yes. Like you got it? Because y'all can coast in the spring. And y'all can get by in the summer. But somebody got to stay focused through the fall and the winter. And I can tell y'all right now, in our marriage, I'm always focused in the fall. But he's always focused in the winter. So you have your season. Yeah. That you're stronger in. Every couple does. How do you know which season when it's when it's raggedy and he doing stuff, I'm sorry, y'all get couples. Time. It's fine, <laughs> and he's doing stuff that's working your nerves, things that didn't bother you before, just really grinding your gears right now. You're in the winter or the the fall season, and if it's just oh, you just oh, if you're there, that's not your season to master. But if you're in, you know what? He's doing this, but this man loves me. This he's still my blessing from God. He did see that. Then you're strong in that season. Whenever he's doing the things that work your nerves to no end and you're able to still see God and glorify God in it, that's your strength. Well, how so how do you know that that season is the season? Like, okay, you okay, you can say, Hey, I'm still strong, but how do I know like it's the fall season or it's the winter season? So you can identify which season you're from. Like I hope you understand. When you I, I repetition. I'm sorry, when you notice repetition, you're seeing more and more of that consistency. So you're seeing more, more right. of your that you identify. Right. You got it? And then the time that you know that um, he's really strong is when you're PMSing and you're emotional and you're snappy and you got all kinds of stuff going on and you're responding to him crazy and he is cool as a cucumber. Like, baby, it's okay. I love you anyway, blah, blah, blah. And you know you don't deserve that response. You don't know why you're all over the place. Then you know that's the area and that's the season where he's strong. So you need to physically mark that time of the year. Use an actual calendar. The enemy always attacks us. Our fall season normally comes around January and February. So you know we started doing we start taking vacations in January and February. Right. That's winter in the earth, but it's it's fall in our marriage. And so once we realized when we would fight the most, right. Right. And it starts the fall hits around January or February. They don't fall in the order that you think they're going to fall in, but we've identified them. So when we used to create stress and all of it, it just be tense for no reason and we didn't understand it and all of that. Man, July for about 14 years was the worst month in our marriage every year. Financially, physically, we may have sex five or ten times in the whole month. Y'all? Yes. Five, right. But we had to identify it. You know what I mean? Once we identified it, we started circumventing that and mm, getting snowmobiles and shovels and, and sidewall warmers and extra coats and mittens. Yeah. So we started preparing. So when the winter come, we're like, oh, it's winter. We're on the same page. We started talking about it more. I ain't mean to stay here this long, but apparently there's a need right here. So, of course, now that we're preparing more, and when we hit that fall around January, February time, we, we always take a trip. We unplug from everybody and everything. You notice in January every year, y'all got to preach, y'all got to run the service, y'all got to run the church. We be gone somewhere. Reconnecting, refocusing on us so the enemy can't rob us of our peace anymore. Once you, speak in the microphone, ma'am, so that lady can hear you. It doesn't hit the same when you are prepared for it. Right. So it doesn't you know, tear you apart. Right. Almost like a, uh, I don't know if y'all get hurricanes or whatever. But we, we get, get tornadoes. Okay. okay. So we get hurricanes. So you got to be prepared for when it comes because it's going to happen, but you ain't going to respond the same. Right. Because now you realize, okay. You got a strategy and a game okay. plan. Listen, all successful marriages have strategies and game plans. Does it happen every Every year. Every year. Like clockwork. For you, for like mothers, 
it happens when our at the time our kids is acting crazy or when your relationship <laughs> seriously or when your relationship like not with your husband but with outside people your mom or your whoever when those are going crazy that's how you know that your winter is coming up in your marriage and i only know that because when me and her i know our season of when the enemy tried to come in our relationship, you know what I mean? And it just so happened in the marriage, right? Around my birthday time every year. And it never, it's never, uh, it's never just that one time, you know what I mean? It's every year. So when I identified and let her know, hey, this is our season, this season the enemy comes in. Then around that time, it after August, then the, set, the fall comes. So now that she said that, I can tie the two. You know what I mean? So when it's crazy with other relationships, then you know it's a clear indicator that you're winter with your marriage is coming. And you you have to be prepared, like she said. You have to be prepared for it. Don't be in denial. Oh, that'll never happen to me. <laughs> when we first got faith. when we I, we had faith when we first got married, we were having sex anywhere from five to seven times a day every day. I would menstruate maybe three times out of the three days out of the week, but apart from them three days, we were getting it in. So to go from that, go from that to 10 times, or I think maybe 11 times in a month, uh, 10 years ago, we only had sex 11 times. Not 10 years, about five, six years ago. And we had a conversation. I was like, are you not attracted to me anymore? No, are you not attracted to me anymore? <laughs> well, because we've always been attracted to each other. She said, you got to have that too. You got to have that. Oh. Them two oh. times a week and five days. We ain't done one five days. 20 years. You count two times in 20 years that we went more than five days. No, but see, we found out we was just getting over It wasn't about attraction. But we had to make our needs a priority over this church, over the stadiums, over work, over money, over everything. Because sex was designed by God to keep bringing us back together. All right, let me go. Let me skip because this is some more stuff. Let me get to... I'm just going to ask to... Ooh, I'm so sorry to keep y'all because we're supposed to be out of here six, 15 minutes ago. Um, I'm just going to, y'all say stop when y'all hear it. Why do Christian men pass up the women who may not have a big butt, lots of education, or be very sexual, but they do cook clean and serve him hand and foot and have a real relationship with God, only to choose a gold digging worldly woman <laughs> who don't put God first, don't cook, don't clean, or don't treat him with respect? When first meeting them, how can men tell when women are a good wife material? How soon should you introduce a man that you are interested in marrying? Oh, I'm going to keep going until y'all say that's the one you want to hear. I want to hear the first one. Why do Christian men pass up the women who may not have a big butt? You got a butt. Lots of education. I'll be very sexual. But they do cook and clean. Oh, and then they go marry a gold digger. Right? That won't cook and clean for them. You want to know the answer to that? Two reasons. Um, the women who are not cooking and cleaning are usually spending time enhancing their personal, their, their physical body. They're in the gym or they pay the money to Dr. Miami to give them the big butt and the breast that sit up. They put on the lip gloss, you know, the small waist and the long hair weaved all the way down their backs and they wear the stilettos because church girls usually just want comfort. They don't want to wear no high heel shoes. But well, I'm just answering the question. And so men are sight stimulated. So the one that invests the time to impress him. That's why I tell y'all single women, your appearance is important because we shop with our wallets and our emotions, they shop with their eyes. They're either gonna buy you or fry you with their eyes. Yeah. Buy or deny, based on what we see, not what you said, not what you did, but what we saw. You don't have to have big butts, big breasts and all of that. You just gotta look good. You gotta take care of yourself. Beauty is important to a man, it's a, I, what I tell y'all, a man's top three. They want you to be more spiritual than them, respectful, submissive. They want you to be physically attractive to them. 
You, you got that? And they want peace. Those are the top three. Everything else falls under that. They want you to be holy, better than them. They want you to be attractive. And they want you to be peaceful. Man, am I wrong? Oh, I just would add be fun to be around. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. So, well, that would be number four. And I would even venture to say the fifth one, family oriented. Yeah. Contrary to what y'all think, right. men want their women to be family oriented. We want a family. We want a family. We want a family. We just don't want a family with anybody. Y'all got it? Yeah. <laughs> Some of them do. How soon? should you introduce a man that you're interested in marrying to your family members, friends, and pastor or senior leaders? Wait, wait, wait. Oh, you want to hear that one? Okay, so are you saying uh, when he proposes? I was saying before. Uh, as a wife coach, I I'm not trying to go against what my husband is saying. My suggestion is very different, ladies. Because we shop with our emotions. And if you wait until he proposes, either paper is touched pen, or there's an emotional slow tie developed. And then if he proposes and you bring him to the pastor and that you trust that pastor with your life and that pastor says, oh, he's not from God, now you got to undo a soul tie. Or go against your leadership and marry him anyway. <laughs> okay. So how, okay. So do you want to know when? Yeah, when, but then I'm... For me... The first time you like him enough to potentially enter into a relationship with him. Say why. why? <laughs> I'm saying don't do it. Somebody, somebody just say do it. Do it. Because your little cat may be thobbing when you talk to him, but he ain't going to make nothing thob on me. I don't have an emotional attraction. I don't have a physical attraction. So I can sit in front of him and just discern who he is from God and does he have your best interest at heart right up front to save you the emotional turmoil that may come with prematurely connecting and developing a soul tie with him. But what ends up happening is What's when you're going to do whatever it is you want to do because it's your cat and you're grown. You end up with four babies. Because the show can't end you. Let me tell you something. You're going to get married over FaceTime? Why not? FaceTime, if it's good enough for us, then it should be good enough for you. I got her face, bro. <laughs> I was just saying because the person is not here. Let me tell you. Now, it's not okay. You open this door, and they already told me to do it. Let me tell you something. Don't you ever put yourself on a clearance rack for a dude. It's not if. It's if. It's not an if you want, if you're available. Don't you ever start creating convenience for a man to cut corners to have you. Because if you start cutting corners, he's going to expect you to keep making it convenient for him to have you. No, I work whatever you got to go through to get me. Because when you get me, you got something. So, bet. tell you what. What it's going to cost you to ride in this Cadillac, you're going to have to make the full payment. Ain't no discounts, ain't no deferred payments. Player, get on a plane. <laughs> Say again. Say it one more time. Get a hotel room. Okay, let me just drop this. <laughs> no, no, no. Do your, like you Do your hands like this. Do your hands like this. You finna pick this up and you finna carry it because it's going to make you free. Keep them open. <laughs> Tell him, hey, the day, the night, or in the morning, whenever you leave here. Call him and say, you know what, I'm really feeling you. And we've been talking about this and we've been talking about that. But at this point, my cloud, my judgment concerning you is cloudy. I really need for you to meet my leaders. Because I believe you are my husband from God. But they don't have an emotional connection to you. And if you value this relationship, oh, you telling me, Tay? Have y'all been talking about marriage? In a way. But in a way, you either have or you have. That's what I was thinking. I mean, we mentioned what we wanted. And so, yes, marriage is 
It has to what level? So first off, let me just do this. Let me just say this. I want to. I stand corrected. What my wife said earlier. Normally, I. The reason why I said that because a lot of times these guys be talking nowadays and they, they just be pulling, pulling, playing games and dragging feet and wasting your time. You know, that's why I said what I said, man. So I want to just make it known. I, I, I don't. I, well, I'm, I'm this person, I don't like people wasting my daughter's time. So, here's the deal. If y'all are even rushing around the subject of marriage, then yes, we need to have, we need to start introducing the family. We need to go before people who, again, like she said, has no personal investment in you. <laughs> You understand? It's 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 for your protection because there's a lot of men out there that will waste your time. Period. They'll waste your time and they'll waste your time because you allow them to waste your time. If you, this is, I hate to say it, and I'm not trying to put it on you, but ladies, you have the power and the control to say, hey, you're not going to waste my time. Period. I know what I want. I'm not trying to arm wrestle you into a marital relationship, but in the same breath, you're not going to waste my time. So if you don't want what I want, let, let's stop this now. I'm not dating for companionship. I'm dating for a husband. Period. I'm not dating you for companionship. I'm dating because I want a husband. I want to be a wife. And that's the conversation you need to have. So if I'm it, we need to start talking to folk. If I'm not it, then let's cut this off right now. We can be friends, what have you, until you make up your mind what you really, really want. To all my single women in this room, do not let any man waste your time. If he wants you, he wants you. And it ain't gonna be no mystery. You ain't got to wonder. You ain't got to figure it out. He's gonna say, I wanna marry you. He's gonna say it. And it ain't gonna take him long. It doesn't take him a year to say it. Contrary to what you've heard, contrary to what's been said, it doesn't take a year. I'm gonna give y'all, put y'all up on game. Usually a man knows about, knows within the first three months whether or not you the one or not. Four days. Three months. At, at least the first three months. He knows within three months if you're the one or not. If he don't know, if y'all have a conversation, well, I think it might be the one. He ain't it. He ain't it. It doesn't take a year for him to figure out whether he want to marry you or not. Like, since you don't think I'm the one, who ain't it. Well, if they're they're early in their say, they're not like deep deep. They're not three three months deep. Are y'all three months deep in there? Yeah. No. So they just have a general conversation. But if it's starting to happen in that process, then y'all need to start having conversations about where is this leading? Where are we going? What do you really want? I want, I'm not dating for, I'm, it's ladies, you've got to specifically say this. I am not dating just to have companionship. 
I'm begging because I'm looking to be married. And if that's not who you are, then I don't want to waste your time. Share those thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> you got this. I don't want you to cry. Baby girl, listen. I don't Hold want on. you to be alone. Hold, Hold on. on. I want to, I'm sorry, Danny. I want to hear her thoughts. And I know it's uncomfortable, but this process is what's going to produce change. Right? So we're not internalizing it and repeating cycles. What we're doing now is we're confronting it head on. This is crazy. You just have to do like well, Kari, you are so mean. It's so interesting to see from the other side. So you see yourself, right? Yes, because this was us at Globe Life. And yes. We literally, we're having a conversation, and she was like, "This is exactly what it is, and this is exactly what it isn't. And if you don't follow through with this process, you're gonna be in this kind of situation." The worst thing that you can do as a co-owned woman is to give yourself enough time to start liking a man, enough to catch actual feelings for him before you present him to the leadership. Because when you bring him up front, number one, that's going to tell you how serious he is. But if he don't want to come to church and make that happen, you already know he's not going to do what's needed on hard day when it comes to making sure your needs are met. Co-owned women are called to co-owned men. Co-owned men follow through with the tough processes and you may get a little break in that process but they always come through and that is a man who's going to take care of you long term and that is the reason why we bring them number one it gets them here when they come here it shows you how serious they are and when they're not afraid to talk to them or they talk to them in spite of their fear it shows you that they're really dedicated and if they truly see you as a wife when they come back that next time then you're you're pretty much locked in there's a very good chance of the lock-in, but if you can't get past to those first steps, that's going to spare you so much heartache in the beginning. Because that that one hump, that one hump is one of the biggest stages here. And I, and I Let me, hold on, before, hold on, Alina, hold on. Getting them here at COIM, Continual Outpouring <laughs> International <laughs> Ministries, God doesn't send anybody through those doors by coincidence. Anybody that comes to Coim comes by divine appointment. You are already a Coim woman. You are being conditioned by God to be a virtuous wife. I told all of y'all, you looking for the fine man with six figures with great sex and, and all of that up front and he'll man of God can quote the scripture and just leave. You're not a Coim woman. We are anointed for God's hard cases. He's coming with baggage. He's coming with issues. There's going to be drama or trauma that's going to be tied to him if he is a husband for you. So it's best that you condition yourself now to go through those hard things. Every man sitting in this room either came with disability, uh, baby mama drama, uh, uh, financial duress, uh, no education, uh, 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 divorced already with kids and you got to blend the family and all, <laughs> all of that. We don't get the easy cases. So we are, everybody in this room that's a member of Colin, we already know he's a hard case. But the other thing is we specialize in hard cases because not many churches teach the women what we teach so you can accept a man with all his flaws and love him unconditionally and have a plan in place and be the answer that help me that God has anointed you to be. You're already a wife. But uh, if he does not know that, you're not going to convince him, but you are going to help him understand. And once he understands your value, if he still is not ready to take you off the market, then you got to move on. But it's hard to move on if you've either had sex, developed a soul tie, fallen in love, or developed 
Feelings, lift your head up. <laughs> I want you to know it doesn't really matter what phase you're at in the relationship. If it's of God, regardless of what has transpired in the past, our job is to help you line all of it up with his will. And confrontation forges growth. There is no way for us to know what he's working with if we don't get to see him. And if you knew what it took to get on across that finish line, y'all would be already be there. He doesn't have a romantic attraction and connection with him, and neither do I. The good thing about you, young lady, is you're sitting in a room, a room full of people that have your best interest at heart. A room full of people that are praying for you. A room full of people that are rooting for you to get across that finish line with the man that God has for you. And you got a room full of people that will bust his hair wide open and become with feet. the foolishness. With a dirty object. <laughs> and ask Jesus to forgive us all. That's it for Mary. <laughs> Okay, first 48. I want you to understand you're not in it by yourself. There is no right or wrong answer because the only thing, the right is not what's going to make you free and the wrong is not what's going to make you free. Only the truth is what makes you free. So whatever that truth is, if you're not comfortable divulging it publicly and openly in this room, you don't have to. But I'm telling you, Transparency is the answer in an environment like this because all of us are sitting here with our underwear down. You see our stretch marks, you see the pimples on our booty cheeks, you see our flaws, you see cut marks from surgeries, you see cellulite, you see all of that. And none of us are ashamed because we all have some. Right. You have never been married, you don't have children, you have a good paying job, you got two master's degrees. You're beautiful. You are anointed. She said one master's yes. Two degrees. Two degrees. You are educated. <laughs> My point is, you're a catch. And you live at home and you sitting on, on the kitty instead of being charity in the community. You ain't doing charity work with what's between your thighs. You're and you're not entrepreneurial. <laughs> you got it? So now I need for you, we can focus on him, but I need for you to just take a few minutes and say, how come, what is it about me that doesn't understand that I am bringing so much to the table that if he doesn't see it, I really don't want to be connected to a man who's blind in the spirit and in the natural. Five kids, an ex-husband, a baby daddy, all that. Four days. That's my ring. Baby. Well, he do what he do. Day one. I can tell. I tell whole world. <laughs> tired of waiting, tired of being by yourself. Tired of dealing with raggedy dudes. He does. And that's the point. That right there says that you are just about ready to get your husband because I was never full of energy when my husband came. Twice. Me neither. Say it again. I was never full of energy when my husband came. The first time I gave God an ultimatum, the second time I felt like that was rude. So I was like, Lord, I'm just here, okay? Do what you do. I'm a little exhausted in this process. But this is the first time I was like, I ain't doing it. If you want me to get married, you better come with it. Right to my front door. I ain't doing it. Yeah. Normal for us to hear the ghost of 